Lift your hands. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Let no stone be unturned. Let no good thing be withheld. And when we come out of this fire, we shall come forth as pure gold. For thou art the potter, we are the clay. Mold us, make us, break us if you have to, but please make us over again. In Jesus' name we pray. If you love the Lord, shout amen in this place and put those hands together. Before we sit down, can we, do, can we do this real quick? And we can save it for the end. I want you to do it for everybody. Every volunteer, every uh, musician, every singer, uh, every person who gets up at 5, 6 in the morning to make sure we can come in here and everything is set. Can you just praise God for all of our volunteer staff, all of our praise and worship leaders? God bless you and thank you. I always believe that you should thank the person who prepared the place you walked into. Uh, because it would be less enjoyable if you had to enjoy and prepare. So we thank every prayer warrior, every person who uh, makes this service do what it do. And can you praise God for all of our Lighthouse Nation who would be here if they could. To everybody watching online, we greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, you are friends and some of you, you're just family members we've never met. Uh, but thank you for being with us uh, online today. And hopefully this word translates to you. Uh, the same way it will in this house. Now, I don't know if I'm a preacher, right, but I know it's a word. And the word is going to be good. It's just sometimes the instrument ain't right. Uh, but I hope today that I can get this message out of me because I know God gave it to me. I couldn't have thought of it if it were not for him. Um, and I want to share it with you. Um, we're in this month of December. We're talking about finding our purpose. And... Um, you know, I think I think you'd be much happier if you knew why you were here. And I think that sometimes you have to realize that your purpose, it isn't what you think it is. Oh, and by the way, it ain't even what somebody you love told you. We have a tendency, people come up and tell us, oh, you should be this. Well, I, I, I have to wait on God to say that. I remember people told me all the time, you should be a pastor, you should be a pastor. Now, I, I'm, I'm glad he called me, but had I had another choice. Oh, you don't choose this on purpose. Come on, y'all. I, I know a lot of people, I'm glad to be in the service, but I would have picked something else. Oh, yeah. It's a lot of jobs where you can drive the car you want and ain't nobody got nothing to say about it. You can live in peace. You can, you can, you can, you know, but I'm here because I am appointed. And some of you all don't get to destiny because you're looking for the path of least resistance. And you feel that comfort is the check mark that you have arrived. But sometimes you know you're in the right place when it's uncomfortable. Because it's the discomfort that makes you govern yourselves accordingly. Lord, if I wasn't no preacher, I don't know what would be wrong with me. Mighty God, it's the cloth that keeps me in order sometimes. Because I'm a human being, right? And, and so I have to balance what he called me to do with what my flesh wants to do. Oh, y'all ain't going to say amen. See, you get to cuss people out and it don't matter. But if I do, you know, you can cuss people out. Your, your girls will be like, get them. If I cuss somebody out, it's terrible. I have before, but it ain't, I don't, I don't, I don't do it now, today. First Kings chapter six, first Kings chapter six. I'm going to read verse one. Let me see. I think verse seven. And I'm going to read verse 11, 12, 13, 14, maybe. Let's just start with, with verse one. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month of, everybody say Ziph. Ziph. I'll explain it. 
which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. Let's look at verse number seven. And the house when it was in building was built of stone made ready before it was brought thither so that there was neither, listen, hammer nor ax nor any tool of iron head in the house when it was building. I want you to pay close attention to what he did not use to build. Okay, let's look at verse number, let's see. Let's look at verse 11. And the word of the Lord came to Solomon saying, concerning this house which thou art in, uh, thou art in building, if thou wilt walk in my statues and execute my judgments and keep all of my commandments to walk in them, then I will perform my word with thee. Somebody say, do it with me, God. And the reason why he's going to do it is not because of how good you are, but I told David I would. You better be glad your parents had a relationship with God. To some of y'all are worrying about your children, God says, I'm going to bless them through you until they meet me. And I will dwell among the children of Israel, and I will, listen, and will not, I will not forsake my people. God's not going to leave you. It may take you a while to get there, but everybody shout, God's not going to leave me. And here's the uh, caveat of the text. So Solomon built the house and finished it. You got a couple more weeks and what you started this year got to be done. You, you're not taking what you said you were going to do in 2022 talking about, okay, well, next year. No, you're going to get it done. You're going to finish it. You just got to hurry up, but you're going to finish it this year. And God still has enough time to make this the best year of your life. You can make more money Friday than you made the rest of the year. But you have to finish it. What is happening in the text is David commissioned the temple workers to build the new tabernacle or temple for God. And God said, David, you can't build it because you got a past. And I'm going to do it through your son, Solomon. Solomon had no idea that God was going to do this through him. Do me a favor, look at your neighbor and tell him, say, neighbor, neighbor. God, told God told me to tell you that the house, the house is in your name. That's what I want to talk about. Oh, some of y'all missed it because you're still thinking about yesterday. Look at your other neighbor, the one that's smiling, the one that ain't on their phone, the one that ain't texting. And I want you to look at him and say, God told me to tell you that the house is in your name. Now, if you believe it, tell him, period, the house is in your name. I feel God. That's a word for somebody. Well, we're going to finish this year strong, guys. Mm -hmm. Devil, you have no place in our affairs. You're evicted. It ain't your house. 
the house is in my name, which means I can refuse service. I can refuse entry. I dare you put the devil on notice and tell him you have been evicted. You have been quarantined. You are not welcome in my daughter's bedroom. You are not welcome in my kitchen because the house is in my name. So over the past several years, the world has had ample opportunities to just fall completely apart. School shootings, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Tatiana Jefferson. We could have lost our mind. Fluctuating economy. COVID-19. How many of y'all were struggling when you wanted to go to church and just couldn't because COVID said we couldn't come and you were at home like some people want to stay home but I, I was glad when they said unto me. Water contamination in American cities. Who would have ever thought you would have had to close your mouth to take a shower in America? Truth is, we just had to boil our water a couple weeks ago right here. Because you ain't really ever safe. You, you really can't ever let your guard down. You may not hear about this, but if you go to California and states in the West, there are cities with Americans in it that don't even have water to drink. Because big companies have uh, remanufactured the irrigation system and has supplanted a majority of the water shortages to grow crops like almonds uh, while the rich get richer and the poor keep dying. Mental health, suicide. It's real. And we can keep on walking around praising God anyhow. And we can keep on shouting. But 40 million black people in this country are at the place where our opportunities are scarce. Racism and race relations where God has created us all equal. And here it is, you have people who are white who love everybody who get bad raps because of those who don't. And then you have black people acting like they're not racist either. <laughs> oh, because if you want to find a real racist person, my granddaddy... <laughs> was racist. <laughs> Crime in the inner city. You can't even watch anything on Instagram without clicking through the trigger warning and seeing people shoot up a birthday party, a football game. This world is crazy. And the government? That's a whole nother story. But one thing we all have in common, you in this room and you watching me online, one thing we all have in common, you wanna know what that is? We are still here. Could have been you outdoors. 
with no food and no clothes. You could have been left alone without a friend or just another number with the tragic end, but he didn't see fit to let none of these things be. And every day by his power, he keeps on blessing me. So this is what I'm going to do. Thank you, Lord. For all, that's, a, that's, I got, you got seven seconds. For all you've done. For me. But one of the epidemics and pandemics that I believe is not being discussed that I want to bring to the conversation is I think that there is another tactic that the devil is using to destroy God's people. And that is, are you ready? This is my supposition, the generational gap. Because God gives the young man for war. He gives the old man for wisdom. And when the old man and the young man and the young woman and the old woman are not connected, you now have people who war without wisdom. And I know our generation is fighting without wisdom because if you know anything about history, our mamas taught us that we don't fight and embarrass ourselves online. What goes on in the house stays in the house. And the reason why I know we're lacking wisdom is because we live on the internet telling our business and then want to get mad when people talk about us. I just want to put this out here. You ain't got to post everything. Stop going live and crying and telling about how somebody beats you only for you to be with them tomorrow. And the generational divide has brought us so far apart that the older generation believes that they're right. The younger generation believes that they're right. So now we have miscommunication, which leads to misunderstanding. And you should see how we look at one another. The older generation is looking at you young people like, what in the world is wrong with you? The younger generation is looking at the older generation saying, see, you don't understand nothing. Because if you understood, you would understand. Great explanation. <laughs> that right in this room, we're all worshiping together. Our biggest divide right now is not our color. It is not our economic status. Right now, it's the generational divide. We don't agree on much of nothing. Let me tell you something. Young people, older people hate your music. I don't know what y'all saying, <laughs> except for there are three words repeated over and over and over, auto-tuned, seven million copies sold. <laughs> Meanwhile, the writers of old, now they were writing. Marvin said, what's going on? Older people, I know you think that your Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes and look, you just, Lord, she done shot, she said, ooh, the whispers, the OJs, 
I know you think that stuff is amazing, but your children hate it. Because we don't agree on nothing. We don't even agree on sports. You got one generation talking about Michael Jordan is the best. And then you got LeBron James here breaking every record. And you still have a generation holding on. Why? Because every generation holds on to its heroes even when the hero is no longer one. So what do we do? Is one generation correct that if you don't come to church, that you don't have a relationship with God? Or is the other generation correct that I can worship God? Thousands of people are watching me right now online, eating pancakes, laying in their bed, sitting in the bed with their Yorkie with a sweater on. And the dog is watching me too, just like this. I want everybody online, send us, I want you to direct message me to picture your dog watching the sermon. Watch how many dogs love the word. Dogs just be. Generational divide. They hate the way you dress, you hate the way they dress. Older people looking at us, ooh, her, her skirt could just, just be a little longer. Could you? She ain't got to show everything to everybody. And the younger generation is like, I ain't your age. And when you were my age, you dressed like this too. Oh, it's going to get real up in here today. <laughs> Holler at me if I'm telling the truth so far. Everybody in here who considers yourself young, make some noise. Watch this. Everybody who considers yourself old, make some noise. I guarantee you some young people shouted on the old. And some old people shouted on the young. We're going to talk about why. I was talking to one of our staff members. She's young. You know, we asked her about marriage. Her perspective of marriage ain't even close to what we were raised to think about marriage. We were, <laughs> we were told that we had to get married because you couldn't shack up. Come on, y'all. You got to go to church to know about shacking. Any, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Oh, your mama knew my mama and our daddies knew each other. Cohabitating. These young people like... Um, uh, I'm going to be over there every day anyway, so why are we going to get two different apartments? <laughs> See? It's, it's just, it is what it is. They combine in bank accounts before they get married. <laughs> oh, that was a no-no. Some of y'all married and still ain't put it together, so you... <laughs> like, you got your job. You pay the light bill, you pay the gas bill, I'm going to pay these car notes, we're going to split the groceries down the middle and... And one of the places I think the generational divide is the biggest is in ministry. In the church. We have young leaders who think old leaders should just move out of the way. And you have old leaders saying, I would sit down if I trusted your trifling tale. When I grew up, I'm 41 years old. When I grew up, it was a mandate without cause that you just had to go outside for no reason. Go outside and bleed and do nothing. When I grew up, everybody here who grew up, when I grew up, you know exactly what water tastes like out of a... How many people ever drunk water out of water holes? Raise your hand. You little young Thundercats ain't never done it. All you know is bottled water. We, we had to drink our water right out of the sink. And we took an old milk jug and just... And that was the water jug.
You ask a young, pre a young person what kind of car they want today, Range Rover. What? <laughs> the first car we had growing up probably wasn't a car no more. <laughs> but things are changing. And, and you, can't, you, can't put your you can't put your children in the clothes you were raised in. The amount of bullying and things that they would have to deal with at school. Yeah, I remember my mama used to buy our pants big so we can grow into them. And you knew we was growing because the line from the starch, every time we unfolded the plants, pants. By the time I got to high school, I looked like a zebra. I had a stripe every two inches. I think she bought me a pair of, pair of pants that was a 36 when I was in the fourth grade. I went to college. But it's different. It's different. But in church, we, we can't seem to get it together. Every other industry and discipline has learned that collaboration works. Adidas charges $100 for a sweatsuit. Gucci charges what it charges for a sweatsuit. But then they combined and drew the cost up. Every lady in here... You seen that new Fendi Versace bag? You have, I know you have. <laughs> Off-White collaborates with Nike. Nike collaborates with Louis Vuitton. Everybody's collaborating and yet the church can't have one revival with more than one pastor in it. And if I was hosting a meeting for the city, of, for pastors, some would come, but there were some who wouldn't show up if it was the site of the second coming of Jesus. Why? Because they didn't think of it. And how is it that the church that started together can't get together? Come on, y'all. We're going to talk today. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. So what I am bringing to the table for conversation, there is a remedy in the scripture for how the generations can come together and do something powerful for God because the only way what we're building for God is going to last is if the man with the wisdom connects with the man with the strength and we can continue to perpetuate the cause for Christ throughout generations and throughout time. That means that we came from a time where when we saw a child that was not doing the right thing, there was more than just your mama who could say something to you about the direction of your life. But we live in a day and time now that we don't want nobody to say nothing to our children. And the problem with that is, is if your child can only be corrected about the things that you know, then 90% of the things they get away with. Because they act different in front of you than they do when you are not looking. And the other problem is, is that we have adults who will punish their children for behaviors they have. So your child will get a spanking or a whooping or punishment for talking in class but you don't never be quiet either. They'll get in trouble for falling asleep in school, but you've been asleep already and the sermon just started. And so we think that because we're, and, and this is that, that thing that came from that generation that I think needs to go right out of the window. Do as I say. Ridiculous. Oh, I'm going to disturb. Everybody's going to be mad after this, so you might as well all just say amen together. I'm going to get all y'all. So one of the greatest undertakings that we ever saw in the scripture was when David says, you know what? We witnessed the epiphany. He says, I live in a house of cedar. And the ark of the covenant, the ark of God, which represents the presence of God, it's in a tent. He said, ain't no way in the world I should be living better than God. So I'm going to build a temple. And then Nathan, who is the prophet, said to David, you know what? Whatever is in your heart to do, 
you ought to do it. And when Nathan went to sleep that night, God said, Nathan, I know you're a prophet, but you told David wrong. David can't build my temple because David got too much blood on his hands. And David has killed too many people. So now tell David that I said that Solomon is going to build the temple. And all of a sudden, David realizes that something that he thought he was going to do, he was not going to do. Here is the first point. God told me to tell you this. In this next year of your life, he's about to revise the prophecy. Oh, God, I'm taking my time today. There are some of you who think you know what God is going to do with you next, and I know what they told you, and I know what's in your journal, and I know what you have written in your affirmation cards, but God says, I reserve the right to change the direction, and I'm revising the prophecy over your life. When I first gave you the prophecy, you were in this position, but you let life put you in that frame of mind, and that frame of mind has caused me to change my mind. And you'd be surprised at what God was going to do with you until you became who you currently are. When God made that promise to you, you were nice. When God made that promise to you, you were not broken yet. When God made that promise to you, you hadn't shut your heart on love. But now life has put you in this position where you have become callous and God says, I cannot get my glory through a blocked channel, so now I'm going to reverse what I said. And I'm going to revise the prophecy. And Solomon, the young man, has to do it. And let me tell you what David did that I think that every person of every older generation does, should do. David went to Solomon and said, I wanted to do it. God said, I couldn't, so I'm going to support you. Listen to me, older generation. These young people don't just need your advice. They need your support. Every time you come to them, you can't be telling them what they're doing wrong. And every time you come to them, you can't be trying to correct them. Sometimes you need to go to them and say, baby, I understand why you smoke weed because in the 70s, Oh, come on, y'all. Don't act like back in the day you wasn't at Woodstock having a good time. And if you ain't that old, if you're not that old, what I'm really saying is every person in here who has age on you, you used to be and do the same thing that you're criticizing in these young people. So what you need to do is go to them and say, you know what? What you're doing, it might not be right, but look at proof that God can bring you out of anything. And if you'll just trust God, he can do something with your life. Do I have any witnesses in the room today? I'm going to get there. Look at your neighbor and say, let's do it together. Let's do it together. Let's do it together. Let's do it together. David said, I'm going to build the Lord a house. The Lord said, no, you ain't. No. Solomon's going to do it. And David wrote a check. The Bible says that he gave a certain gift. When theologians translate their offering, they say that David's first offering to the building of the temple was over a billion dollars. How expensive was the temple when a billion couldn't finish it? He gave over a billion dollars to the building of the temple. And God says, David, you can't build it, Solomon can. Now, Solomon represents the younger generation. Let me tell every young person in here today, whether you're young in age or young in spirit, you don't have to live your life always worrying about who's jealous of you. I don't, I'm, 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 I'm kind of sick of y'all always giving these little subtext and tweets online, which is really a reflection of where you are currently psychologically. Because it's amazing how many times you saw that post, but you didn't repost it until you got in that position. Now, all of a sudden, it's good. Everybody's not jealous of you. Every older person is not envious of you. In fact, what this story shows us is that sometimes God will put somebody in your life who will support you. 
But sometimes you can't accept David's help because you got Saul's memory. And so we have so many people around here calling David Saul. David isn't Saul. Saul is Saul. But since you can't trust nobody, you make everybody be Saul. And what David shows us is that when you really know how to handle your trauma, you can be for the next generation what the previous generation was not for you. David's daddy forgot about him. Saul tried to kill him, and he was there for his son because trouble is supposed to show you what not to do. Oh, y'all ain't going to hear me today, but I'm, I'm going to get there. So he says, listen, Solomon, I support you. I'm going to write the check. I'm going to push you into destiny. Tell your neighbor, I'm going to push you into destiny. I'm not jealous of you. I want you to have all that you can have. Yeah, come on, encourage somebody because they haven't had this in a while. I, I wish in all things you would be prosperous and have good health. Baby, if you're about to get married next week, go ahead and do that. If God got a house for you, Invite me over. If God got a car for you, let, if God healed your body, I'll shout with you. I ain't got to tell you what he did for me at the same time you told me what he did for you. I'm just going to spend the next 30 seconds thanking God for what he's done in your life. Slap three people and say, I'm glad he's been good to you because it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he can do for you. Find somebody encouraged and say, I wish millions of dollars in your hands. Come on, stop just praying for yourself and pray for somebody else. Lay your hands on somebody and say, I speak wealth into your life. I speak million dollar ideas into your life. I speak that your family would operate on another level. I speak that you would be healthy and prosperous. Why am I telling you to speak it into somebody's life? Because you reap what you sow. What you don't understand is by speaking it in my life, you guarantee it in yours. Look at somebody say, blow up. Be as big as you want to be. Go as high as you want to go. I hope when you pray, the heavens open up. I hope you open your bank account tomorrow and find $5,000 you didn't expect. I hope you got a check in the mail. I hope your child just got accepted into the bar exam. I hope that they go as far as they can go. All the haters sit down and all the celebrators stand up and bless the Lord for what he's doing in somebody's life. Stop hating on people talking about you think you cute. Just start believing you cute and then just be cute together. Just look at everybody and say, you cute, you cute. Fellas, you say, you, you good, dog. You know, you straight cuss. Do you know what kind of environment we could build online and in the house of God if we stop competing and start collaborating? The devil is tricking us. And while we're out here talking about what they're doing to us, what are we doing to us? It's one thing for a burglar to break in your house. It's another thing for you to punch a hole in the wall. This old song said, when we all get together, what a day it will be. Away with this denomination stuff. That has us thinking that if you're not this denomination, then something is wrong with you. And if you're not this, you're not that. What about the one thing that we all can agree on if you confess with your mouth? The Lord Jesus. And if you can believe in your heart that God has raised his son from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Why is it no longer about salvation? There's ain't but one Lord. It ain't but one faith. It ain't but one baptism. We got to work together. The devil has us divided. He has us divided in our families. He's got us divided in our church. 
He got us divided as a people. He got us divided in our economics. And we can't do much if we're divided. Yet, all around us, everybody's coming together. Political parties that don't have your interest are coming together. And yet, we still keep thinking we can do it apart. You young people, them old folks. And it ought to be a shame, because let me tell you something. If this generation is lost, which everybody keeps saying it is, I hate to hurt your feelings, but if this generation is lost, older people, you lost us. Because we were yours. So if we lost, then the question is, what were you, what were you doing when we, got, when we lost our way? And young people, now that they realize that we're lost, the reason why we can't be found is because now we want their benefits without their story. So now young people want everything that they see the older generation having without understanding that they have what they have because they paid a price. We all just stop judging each other and really look at each other. We can do more together. Me and Pastor Warner can do way more together than we can apart. But the devil has tricked us. And he is the accuser of the brethren. And he has a job to kill, steal, and destroy. The Bible says he is the deceiver. That's the word of God. And any time we lose our collaboration, the devil's in charge. Even when you feel good about your choice. There is nothing in the word of God 